Good evening and welcome to the White House. Uh, we have a, a special live chat here following a State of the Union address from President Obama. Uh, I'm joined here tonight by uh, Brian Deese from the National Economic Council, Heather Higginbottom from the Domestic Policy Council, and Ben Rhodes from the National Security Staff who are here to answer your questions. Before we get into that, I want to remind everyone that you can also ask the President a question. Uh, go to youtube.com to upload your question, whether it's video or text, uh, and vote on others. Uh, that's going to be available for the next few days, and then next week the President's going to answer uh, some of the most popular ones. We're very excited about that opportunity, but you can also ask questions right now. Whitehouse.gov slash live. Uh, there's a link to the Facebook chat room, uh, and we're also keeping an eye on the OFQ Twitter hashtag, so head, head over there and ask questions as well. I know that's a lot to, to process. One other thing before we get started is an exciting uh, bit. We were actually watching the uh, a uh, number of people tuning in. Uh, we had over a million people uh, watch the live stream. It's a very exciting thing, and uh, uh, more and more people are tuning in, so we're just uh, thrilled uh, to, to do this. So let's uh, get things uh, kicked off um, with a comment that came in during the uh, State of the Union. Uh, Ann Britton asked on Facebook, or commented on Facebook, jobs, 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 tax breaks to get more jobs going. I live in Michigan. The economy is horrible. Another local company announced today that they are moving their business out of Michigan. 200 more people in our small town out of work. Something has got to be done. If people aren't working, then no, nothing else is going to work. So, Brian, can you address that and talk about some of the things the president mentioned tonight? I can. And um, for uh, Ann and I think a lot of viewers out there, jobs was first on their mind. And I think what you heard from the president tonight was that jobs is first on his mind as well. Um, you know, when we came into office, when this president took office, the economy was right on the edge of a cliff. We were losing about 700,000 jobs a month. Uh, we've taken a lot of steps and we've made some progress then, since then. We were, last month, uh, we lost about one-tenth as many jobs, but we're still losing jobs. And that's why what you heard from the president tonight was that the priority number one in 2010 needs to be job creation. Uh, he also talked about a number of specific ideas that he'd like to see uh, Congress act on and Congress act on quickly. So let me just mention a couple of them because they actually go to some of the uh, points that Ann, uh, Ann mentioned. The first is tax relief for small businesses. Small businesses create the majority of the jobs uh, in, uh, in this country and they create jobs that contribute the most to local economies. The jobs stay there and the wealth stay there as well. So what the president talked about tonight was let's provide a tax credit for small businesses that hire new employees. A lot of them are starting to think about investing again, starting to think about maybe hiring. We want them to put those jobs uh, on their payrolls now, and we want to give them a tax credit to do that. Uh, second, let's make it easier and more attractive for people to invest in small business by eliminating capital gains taxes for investments in small businesses. And third, Let's expand lending for small businesses because one of the things that's holding our economy back the most is that small businesses still can't get the loans they want to invest. So those were a couple of the ideas on small businesses. You also heard the president talk about some other crucial investments in infrastructure uh, and in clean energy, where in places like Michigan and across the industrial Midwest, we have an opportunity to really regrow our economy on a firmer foundation if we build a, a, on a clean energy uh, foundation. So uh, we're, looking, uh, we're looking forward to working with Congress in the next couple of weeks. As you heard the president say, he wants a jobs bill on his desk without delay. And I think that's what we're, uh, we're all going to be turning towards and uh, working hard on over the next couple weeks. Great. Thanks. Um, Heather, uh, we have a, a cluster of questions that, that touch on education. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm going to toss out three here. Okay. One came from Metaxia Coast on uh, Facebook who said, Tui tuition needs to be controlled. There's no reason for college and university presidents to make more than the president. Um, on Twitter, Irish Caroline said, what's the plan for student loan forgiveness? And will it help recent grads like me, only new ones, only undergrad, et cetera? And Alexa Halford asks, will the changes to the student loans apply to existing loans or just new ones? So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. Those are great questions. And uh, dealing, dealing with the cost of college and tuition has been one of the biggest priorities of this administration from the first day we took office. In the recovery package last year, we began to take steps to really rein in the cost of college. We made uh, major investments in the Pell Grant program. And in addition, we provided a, a tax credit for college costs. And that's something uh, that we're talking about extending into the future. We have a, a package before Congress. The President talked about it tonight. And 
and it's actually passed the House and it's going to go through the Senate, we hope, very soon. It has some exciting provisions in this area, one of which is to uh, uh, create a, and expand an income-based uh, repayment plan. So for that recent graduate who's saying, how can I afford to pay this loan back, they'll only have to pay 10% of their income in that loan. And after 20 years, if the outstanding debt hasn't been totally forgiven, uh, totally paid, it'll be forgiven. And if you're in public service, it'll be after only 10 years. So that's a very exciting proposal that, that we're encouraged to have on the books that we're very close to having into law. And something the president talked about tonight as well, the American Opportunity Tax Credit that we had last year and that we have next year, uh, hope to have next year in the budget as well is also very important. But the first question that was asked, you know, why is a college president making more than the, the, than the president of the United States and what can we really do about skyrocketing tuition? We've taken several steps over the past year. We've proposed several more this year. The president talked about a lot of them tonight. And then he said, look, we're doing our part, but we really need colleges and universities to do their part. They need to really look at their costs and expenses and rein them in because you shouldn't have to, to go uh, underwater to pay for college. It shouldn't be exorbitant for people to pay for their higher education. He said tonight that uh, a high school diploma isn't, isn't enough anymore. You really need that college education and we want to make sure one of our highest priorities is that college affordability um, tenant of our education platform. Great. Okay. Um, ben, uh, Joshua Smith uh, touched on some language that the president used when he was talking about uh, the war in Iraq and the war uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, he said combat troops out what are you calling the troops you're leaving? So can you talk a little bit about uh, what it means to do troop withdrawal and, and the troops that are staying and how we're treating that? Sure. Uh, thanks, Joshua. Well, <clears throat> it's an excellent question. And what the president said today is that he'll remove all of his combat brigades from Iraq by the end of August. And that means essentially at the end of August, the mission will shift and the Iraqis will have responsibility for securing their country. We will have about uh, several tens of thousands of troops left in Iraq. We started, when the, this president came in, there were about 160,000 troops in, in Iraq. We have drawn down to about uh, 50,000 or so at that point. What we mean by the combat brigades coming out, though, is that the mission will shift to then supporting the Iraqis as they're in the lead. And the president has identified three functions that our remaining troops will perform. Uh, one, they will continue to train and equip the Iraqis. Because what we've done is the Iraqis have shifted to responsibility for security but we're still equipping them, we're providing them with some support so that they can carry out that mission. Two, we need troops in the country to protect our large civilian uh, presence there and the troops who are carrying out these training missions. So part of that is a force protection. And the third, uh, the third part of the, the third mission that we'll have targeted after August is the ability to carry out, say, a distinct raid, a counterterrorism raid, if we know that there's a target that our troops have to go out and hit. So it's a very drastic shift in that our troops won't be out on patrol, they won't have responsibility for security of the country, the Iraqis will be in the lead. Then, we have an agreement with the Iraqi government to remove every single one of our troops from Iraq by the end of 2011. So we've been proceeding on a timeline that the president pre presented in the campaign and that he presented early in his administration to remove these combat brigades on a very methodical and gradual schedule up through August. Then the Iraqis go into the lead we will perform these targeted functions with a much lower number of troops, and then all of our troops will be out of Iraq altogether by the end of 2011 based on the agreement that we have with the Iraqi government. So as the president said tonight, uh, he committed to ending the war as a candidate. He's doing that as president. Uh, and, and I would add that we would only be in the position that we're now in Iraq, where we see violence at a far lower level. We see the Iraqis taking responsibility for their future. We were only where we are because of the extraordinary service of our troops. I mean, many who've done tour after tour of duty in Iraq, um, as this president likes to say, they've met the mark of any generation of American servicemen and women. Um, so this is really a tribute to them that we are in the process of ending this war responsibly and successfully by handing it over to an Iraqi government that can take responsibility for its future. Great. Okay, Brian, um, back to a question that Carol Grinnell Hastings asked on Facebook. How about reducing what I'm paying for for a home that's no longer worth what I owe it? So can you talk a little bit about mortgages and sort of the remaining financial crisis that uh, affects just a lot of people in this country? 
Absolutely. Um, and obviously, one of the key drivers uh, of the financial crisis uh, and the economic uh, crisis that we are uh, still digging out of was the housing bubble and the dramatic run up in housing values um, that was really built on, um, you know, the president referred to today, uh, a house of sand. And a lot of that has come out and that's caused a lot of um, real tangible uh, economic pain for uh, folks like Carol and otherwise. Uh, one of the biggest challenges there is for uh, folks who have mortgages that are underwater or under, unaffordable, where the house just isn't worth as much uh, as, as the mortgage they need to pay. And so one of the things that we've been working on is trying to figure out how to let responsible homeowners, those who are in a position to pay and didn't get in, uh, didn't get in over their head by uh, be behaving irresponsibly, uh, to stay in their homes uh, if they can meet uh, reduced payments. And so uh, one back in about in, in February or March, we launched a program designed to give homeowners a chance to modify, uh, modify their loans and bring down their payments if they could demonstrate that they could uh, continue, continue paying. And we've seen, uh, we've seen quite a bit of success. We've seen several hundred thousand families enter into this program and actually uh, be able to uh, m modify their loans. And so, you know, I would encourage uh, folks out there who are struggling to uh, go and uh, go to the, uh, uh, the Treasury website and the FHA website and uh, learn more information about the, uh, the home ownership program uh, that we have going because you, you may be eligible uh, to, uh, to engage in a, in a loan modification. Uh, we, we need to do more though. Uh, the, the housing market is beginning to stabilize, uh, but the reality is that we're not going to see a strong economic recovery unless we can, we can support what is the, strong, the, the largest asset for most families, which is their home. And so again, the president talked about today, uh, we need to continue the steps that we've taken to help reduce mortgage rates uh, and keep, uh, keep mortgage rates affordable. Um, we, have, we have over the past year saved about $1,500 uh, per family by keeping mortgage rates low, uh, but we're gonna need to, need to continue that effort alongside a broader effort to try to continue the economic growth that we've seen because at the end of the day, a strong recovering economy is what we need and we need to solve unemployment at the same time because as we know, you know, home ownership and unemployment are closely related. Uh, so we got a lot of more work to do, uh, but I would encourage people to uh, check out the uh, home ownership assistance program that is in place uh, and, uh, and, and learn more about it. Great. Um, he Heather, we had a, uh, a question from Dennis uh, Fulfer uh, on Facebook. He sort of lamented, nothing gets done with our system. Look at the mess we're in. And the president touched on a little bit of this changing Washington um, uh, 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 effort uh, that, that he's putting forward. Can you touch on some of that? Sure, it's a great question, Dennis. Uh, it's something that the president has been talking about um, certainly during the campaign and when he came to Washington he immediately took steps to really try to try to take some of the special influences out of the policy making process, out of uh, how the government is run. We immediately um, put in place rules to limit the influence of lobbyists in the executive branch. Um, he has been calling on Congress to, um, to uh, get rid of their earmarks, their special um, you know, pork barrel items, something that when he was a senator, he posted any kind of requests like that online. He's encouraging them to do the same if they're going to request them at all. He is encouraging Congress not to send him bills with earmarks. Those earmarks are often the result of a special, influence, special influences uh, lobbying lawmakers to get pet projects and so forth. We think that's the old way of doing business and we're trying to move past that. We've taken unprecedented steps uh, on, around transparency. For example, um, we have posted all of the visitors who come to the White House online and opened that up for the first time. Um, the, the work that we're doing here uh, in a chat uh, online, having viewers and so forth, we want to make this institution, uh, the executive branch, the White House, as open and transparent as possible. Um, We've also done a lot with the legislation that we have um, worked with Congress to pass. The Recovery Act has a, has a reporting requirement, uh, recovery.gov, that, that you can go and look at all of the, um, all of the projects where all the money is going. Um, but one of the things that the President talked about tonight that I think is so important is, is the tone and how, how to Dennis's question, uh, things get done in Washington. Uh, he talked about the need to really work together in a bipartisan fashion. That's what the American people want. Uh, we know that, that that's what they expect and, and we have to work together to achieve that. And the President reaffirmed tonight that that was how he was going to move forward. So we have additional um, policies and programs and initiatives that we'll pursue to improve transparency. But we really want to work with Congress on a bipartisan basis to change the tone in Washington. 
Okay. Um, so something the president touched on tonight, um, Ben, uh, how to end don't ask, don't tell. Legislation, executive order, courts, what, how does it work? Well, it's a great question. Um, you know, the president uh, has a, ba a basic principle as it applies to don't ask, tell, don't tell, which is that um, every American should be able to serve their country, um, regardless of who they love, what their sexual orientation is. So it's his position that we need to repeal don't ask, don't tell, so that, uh, for instance, as we know right now, um, there are many uh, gay and lesbian service members uh, who are serving in the military. They should be able to serve openly. They're performing extraordinary service to our country. Um, so he, he's committed to repealing don't ask, don't tell. Now, don't ask, don't tell is an act of Congress. It needs to be repealed with an act of Congress. So it's not as simple as the president simply deciding to do this and doing it with an order. Uh, that's why he said tonight that he has to work with Congress in order to get this done. He also wants to work with the military because he wants to be sure that the law is repealed in a way uh, that it works through the military, through the chain of command, uh, with the troops, so that everybody knows why the pol how the policy is going to be implemented and what the process is. So what he's going to be doing over the course of the next year is working this issue with the military and in parallel with the Congress so we can get a piece of legislation that repeals uh, don't ask, don't tell, and allows uh, all Americans, regardless of sexual orientation, uh, to serve the country that they love. I don't know if Heather has anything to... I would just add one or two things. One, I think uh, it was really important for the president tonight to um, commit that he was going to work very hard this year with the military, as Ben said, in Congress uh, on this process. Um, we have worked, uh, he has worked um, over the last year that we've been in office uh, on uh, advancing rights for um, gay and lesbian Americans. We've passed the hate crimes law, which was uh, before Congress for years and years, and, and we were very um, pleased that President Obama was able to sign that into law, and we've taken and other steps and will continue to do so and don't ask don't tell is clearly a, a very uh, important piece of that agenda and one we hope to make great progress on this year okay and I should point out that question came from John Sanchez NYC uh, through Twitter um, uh, we're using a hashtag on Twitter called uh, OFQ which stands for open for questions so uh, the next one actually came uh, uh, through there as well from love m 2003 uh, who asks uh, a question probably for Brian uh, what is the plan for boosting exports? Tax incentives or direct lending, working through existing SBA banks? The president talked about making sure we uh, stopped exporting jobs uh, and, and wonder if you could explain a little bit about how we're going to, uh, to change that around. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question and I'm, I'm glad that you uh, picked up on it because it was one of the things that we were excited about in the speech tonight. The president made a commitment uh, to double, uh, set a goal of doubling exports over the next five years, uh, which should create two million jobs uh, in the United States. Exports is one of the real opportunities we have to grow the economy and create jobs because it allows us to build things and make things here in the United States and take advantage of growing and expanding markets abroad. Uh, the question of how we do that um, is, a, is a multifaceted one. You know, first, there are several opportunities that we have to support our businesses, provide them technical assistance, provide them loans uh, uh, to better uh, exploit foreign markets. So uh, through the Exim Bank uh, lending facilities there, through our commercial diplomacy, frankly, uh, being uh, more successful advocates for our businesses and for our, the uh, entrepreneurship that they represent abroad uh, and, sh and giving them access uh, on foreign trade missions uh, um, and otherwise. Another important step is to ensure that our trade laws are fairly enforced. Um, some of the reason why some of our companies uh, don't have successful uh, ability to access foreign markets is because uh, other countries don't always play by the rules. Uh, so this president, when, uh, when he came into office, made a commitment that he was for open trade. He wanted to expand uh, global trading, but in order to do that, uh, we needed to be more rigorous about enforcing our trade laws, and we've done that over the next, uh, over the past year, and we plan to uh, step that up in the coming years. And the third is seeking opportunities to uh, create new trade agreements and open markets to uh, to give our companies more access. And so the president talked tonight about pursuing a global trade round, the Doha uh, global trade round, and continuing to work with partners uh, like uh, like Panama and Colombia and South Korea uh, to seek fair trade agreements that would allow our uh, businesses to access, uh, access those markets. 
so, so there's a lot that we can do. Uh, but again, it's a very exciting area and one where, uh, one where you know, some of the most exciting parts of our economy have a chance to grow. You know, if you just take the issue of clean energy, the global market for clean energy is one of the fastest growing markets uh, in the world. And yet the United States still has a very small share of a lot of these markets in solar panels, in building wind turbines, uh, the, 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 the components that go into wind turbines. If we can get better at that and we can give our companies greater access to these expanded global markets, it's a real great opportunity to create jobs here in the United States, good jobs uh, that, that, that will last. So, uh, so it's an exciting, uh, it's an exciting initiative and you'll be hearing a lot more from the administration about it in the coming weeks. Great. Thanks. Uh, the next question uh, concerns veterans. It came through Facebook from Ben Fortier who says, uh, we can't forget about taking care of our veterans. I'm a Marine combat vet and we need to now turn our attention to caring for vets. Uh, and I know the president brought this up in his speech tonight, so I was wondering if you could touch on that and, and expand. Sure. Uh, well, uh, ben, uh, you said a Marine. Uh, uh, Marine Combat. Vet. Thanks for your thanks for your service, first of all, Ben. Um, and the the president really uh, has had a core commitment to veterans since he was in the Senate. Really, he did a, a lot of work on veterans issues uh, as a senator, and he's com continued that commitment as a president. And I couldn't agree more. As you heard him say tonight, our commitment to our troops doesn't end when they come home. Uh, it continues for the rest of their life. Um, and we've taken several steps. Uh, that I would highlight, I think, that underscore the President's commitment. And, and I'd also say, before I even get into those steps, that as a country, um, we really have to get this right because we have a, an extraordinary number of men and women who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan, many tours of duty. Um, so we, we, we will be dealing with, uh, as we end these wars, and part of the way that we end these wars responsibly is getting right our commitment to take care of those who've stood up for our country. Um, in terms of the steps the President has taken, uh, even though we were in the midst of a recession in a tough budget environment, he made the largest investment in veterans funding that we've seen in three decades uh, last year. And we're going to continue that budgetary commitment uh, into the future. Uh, part of that is d d uh, geared towards having a 21st century VA that can really meet the needs of veterans. So what we've done is we've let more veterans back into the VA system. We've invested a huge amount of money in electronic medical records because one of the complaints we heard from veterans was that uh, they were having trouble passing their, veterans, uh, their uh, records, for instance, from the, panic, from the DOD system to the VA. We've also made huge investments in some of the signature wounds uh, of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, many, many, many vets have come home suffering from traumatic brain injury, uh, which has come from uh, large explosions, uh, which have come from the IED, the improvised explosive devices we've seen used in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as PTSD, um, post-traumatic stress disorder. So we've put new investments uh, in that area so that veterans are getting the care they need for the wounds that they've sustained in these wars. We've also tried to expand care into some of the underserved areas, such as in, in rural America, so that veterans don't have to travel long distances in order to uh, reach uh, uh, military hospitals or veterans hospitals. So all of these things are part of the c commitment that he's trying to keep uh, to have, as he says, a 21st century VA that works for veterans. Uh, and we have an excellent VA secretary in General Eric Shinseki uh, who's carrying out that, that mission. The only other thing I'd add too though is that we also want to make sure that we're standing by uh, our troops and their military families as well. And you heard the pre president reference tonight that Michelle Obama is really leading a national commitment to make sure that military families have what they need. And in terms of that commitment, we've had an increase in pay for our troops. We've also had a, an effort to extend things like daycare. Uh, to make life easier for a spouse, for instance, who's caring for kids while troops are deployed away. So this has been a, a fundamental commitment of the president's. It's something that he feels very passionate about, um, and it's something that he's constantly making sure that we're doing everything that we can uh, to serve our troops as well as they've served us. Um, I don't know if Heather has anything to add there, but um, you know, we're, again, thanks again, Ben, for your service, and this is an issue that we'll continue to work in the years ahead. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Um, Heather, uh, Diane Darrow, asks on Facebook, our schools are suffering from lack of funding. The stimulus money has basically replaced the money the state was contributing. How can technology grow in our schools without proper support? 
It's a great question, um, Diane, and, and we are very committed to ensuring that schools have the resources they need, not just to provide the status quo, not just to ensure that uh, the teachers aren't being laid off and services aren't being cut, but that we can actually accelerate the reforms, that we can employ technology to ensure all of our kids are learning to higher standards, that they have better assessments, um, that they're, they're really prepared for the workforce uh, of the future. Uh, we started last year in the Recovery Act with, as you mentioned, Diana, a, a tremendous invest investment in education. What we were able to do with that money is not, not just say to states, here's some money to prevent layoffs. We know you're struggling right now because of the economic downturn, but here are a few things we think you should be doing and thinking about to, to, with this money to really accelerate some of those reforms. And technology is an important piece of that. One of the things that we focused on was data so that we can better understand how students are learning in a particular school year, uh, how, they're, how they're doing academically, how, uh, what subject areas uh, they need help in, what, how their teachers are doing and performing, and technology plays a very central role in that. Um, a lot of people have commented over the last couple of days that the president announced that outside of national security and including veterans, um, uh, his budget will include a spending freeze. One area that, uh, that requires a lot of very difficult decisions, um, it requires going line by line through the budget and his administration has done that. Uh, but one area where he really said we need more investment uh, is in education and the education uh, department budget will have a significant increase next year um, so that we can not just ensure that, that uh, that states aren't um, cutting services in this tough economic time, but that we're really accelerating reform. Last year, with a, a small percentage of the stimulus monies, we created a competition called Race to the Top. And this was, was about rewarding success. This was about getting states to reach higher, to use technology, to put in new uh, forms of teacher incentives and um, rewarding excellence in the classroom. Uh, what we have found is that we had 40 states in the District of Columbia apply for that money and say, we want to take this race to the top. We really want to transform our schools. Uh, 12 states actually changed their laws to be in, better, uh, in a better position to compete for these funds. Um, and the president announced last week that next year, uh, we're going to try to extend that race to the top. We're going to ask for an, an additional $1.3 billion, and we're going to open it up to school districts so they can compete in a competition uh, for a race to the top. So we, we believe strongly that the, we need more resources, but that we should be targeting them effectively so that we can, uh, we can invest in things like improving teacher quality, that we can really focus on turning around schools, and that we can uh, address things like technology and data and how to use it to ensure that we're being as efficient as we can, um, and really making sure we're providing that complete and competitive education to all of our young people. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm going to interrupt here and just say, uh, again, uh, if you want to ask a question, go to whitehouse.gov slash live. I think we're going to go for about 10 more minutes. Uh, and uh, uh, we are um, uh, trying to get through everything we can. There's a lot of traffic in the chat room. We had over a million people tune in tonight. Uh, and of course, if you don't get your uh, question an answered uh, tonight, uh, go to youtube.com and you can upload a question, whether it's video or text, for the president to answer next week and browse through others and vote on them. We we'll hope you'll uh, check that out. It's going to be a pretty exciting event. For now, let's get back to questions. Um, Brian, star actor, uh, asks on Twitter, <laughs> Uh, Obama mentioned entrepreneurs. What steps are being taken to strengthen the creation of new businesses? Well, um, I think what you heard from the president tonight was a recognition of two things. First is that the small businesses in this country drive job growth. A lot of those small businesses, they, a lot of the small businesses that are going to create the jobs that are going to pull us out of this recovery, they don't exist today. They are new businesses that are going to get formed. Uh, people's ideas that get turned into action and activity. And it's one of the things that has always made uh, the American economy unique and frankly the envy of the world is we have an entrepreneurial spirit and an entrepreneurial drive. Uh, one of the most damaging things about this uh, economic crisis has been that when the banks contracted lending, we had to step in and take actions, often very unpopular and very difficult actions, uh, to keep the economy uh, from going down, uh, going down with it. But now that the banks have come back, they aren't sufficiently lending to small uh, enterprises, people with new ideas but without a base of capital, uh, without, uh, with, that, that frankly there's a little more risk. You've got to take a chance. Uh, so those people, uh, those people and, and the people with the ideas, uh, the small businesses, the people who are going to uh, create jobs, they need more support. So one of the things the President talked about tonight was taking $30 billion 
of the money that has been paid back out of the Wall Street bailout and put it in a fund uh, to help increase lending to small businesses. We know that small and community banks uh, out there in the country do most of the lending to small businesses. So this fund is going to be targeted at helping those banks and encouraging those banks to provide more loans. That's going to be really important because, you know, as anyone who has tried to start a new business or uh, t take on a new venture like this knows, getting capital, getting a loan, getting that first investment is often critical uh, to being able to succeed. Uh, we also, a couple of the other things uh, that I mentioned earlier, but I'll just, I'll just reinforce, providing a tax cut uh, for businesses to hire. Uh, one of the features of that tax cut uh, will be that startups will have a, uh, um, an opportunity uh, to benefit as well. So, you know, if people are on the sidelines and thinking about, uh, thinking about trying to get in the game, we want to give them uh, loans uh, if they can get them, and we want to give them an incentive uh, through the tax code uh, to, to take that chance too. So uh, we're hoping that those uh, initiatives are things that uh, Congress will act on, and again, we'll be working on those hard in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, Heather, Leah Anakin uh, asked, we must pass health care. The process has taken too long. It must end. We have to move on. Can you uh, touch on what the president mentioned tonight about health care? Absolutely. I mean, what the president said tonight very unequivocally is that he's as committed to health care today and its passage as he was in September when he had addressed the joint session of Congress. Um, he talked uh, about the importance of um, coming together to reduce costs. Um, he talked about the fact that uh, by the time he finished the speech tonight, more people were going to have lost their health insurance and we shouldn't we shouldn't and couldn't walk away. He also talked about the fact that he didn't uh, uh, make health care an agenda item because he thought it was politically popular. It was because it, it was fundamentally important to the strength of our economy and to struggling middle class families. This, this is about our American values. This is about strengthening the middle class. This is about tackling uh, a major element of what's driving um, costs for middle class families, and we must take action. We're really at a historic point. Um, we, haven't, we haven't signed a bill into law, but we've had a, a bill pass two bodies of Congress. Um, we're very close. And he really implored both Democrats and Republicans not to give up on this fight. He also encouraged people to put ideas on the table. Uh, he laid out some of the areas that, that we must make progress on. Uh, we're very committed to ensuring that there's not discrimination against people on the basis of pre-existing conditions, that we're tackling health care costs, that we're providing high quality, high quality health insurance, and he's absolutely committed to that. I think the strongest message he had today was, we can't walk away from this, and we need to come together to pass it. Okay. Uh, Ben, uh, Clifton Brown asked this question uh, to the White House panel. The failed terrorist attack on the 25th of December revealed that TSA, DHS, and other agencies have much work to do. Does the president plan to increase these agencies' budgets to expand these agencies? TSA, DHS, and uh, other agencies. Other agencies, <laughs> got it. Well, uh, Clifton, that's an excellent question. Um, you heard the president speak a, a good bit about uh, terrorism tonight, and uh, as he said, um, since he came in, this has been a focus of his, um, both abroad, and he took, uh, took a, he took us through some of the steps we were taking abroad to, to take the fight to Al-Qaeda, um, but at home as well. Uh, and this year, we've disrupted uh, several plots uh, against the United States here, uh, but we've also seen an unacceptable breach in our security on Christmas with the failed attack uh, on the flight above Detroit. Um, and after that, uh, as soon as that attack took place, what the president did is he demanded that we immediately gather all the facts and that we take corrective measures based upon what we learned about what went wrong. Um, and in each of the areas that you cite, we are taking action. So for instance, uh, we learned that uh, our watch list system um, perhaps was not as robust as it could be uh, and that we needed to make sure that everybody that we had uh, certain information on uh, within our, our governmental system, within our intelligence agencies, that posed a certain level of risk uh, needed to be on watch lists that prevented them from flying. Uh, and since the Christmas Day attack, we've seen those watch lists become more robust. Um, secondly, uh, this, uh, this suspected terrorist was able to bring onto a plane uh, some explosive device that frankly would not have been detected um, by the measures we had in place. So what we're doing is we're actually increasing the budgets in that area so that we're developing the kind of detection uh, capabilities 
uh, that can prevent people from bringing uh, explosive devices onto planes uh, that could endanger passengers. This is tricky uh, because, again, we know that al-Qaeda tries to evade our defenses. Um, before 9-11, for instance, it was bringing box cutters on a plane. Uh, in this instance, it was bringing a small amount of powder that, that could avoid detection. But we're committed to investing in the capabilities. And in this instance, he's working with DHS. We're also working with uh, the national labs and the Department of Energy to make sure that we have a research capacity behind this so that we can invest in those capabilities. Um, but also, and most importantly, we want to make sure that we are acting on the intelligence that we have swiftly and effectively. Uh, because what's not acceptable to the president is when we know certain information about an individual, uh, but that information is not acted upon aggressively, it's not connected with other pieces of information that we might have in the government that could prevent a plot. And it was the president's view that, that we did have sufficient information about this individual in different parts of the government, in different parts of the intelligence community, that if it had been acted upon aggressively, we might have been able to prevent him from getting on a plane. So in each of the areas that, that you lay out, our intelligence agencies, our watch list systems, our detection technologies uh, as it relates to air security, we have taken steps to increase resources, but also to demand better performance. And as the president said, it's unacceptable for this kind of incident to take place. And he's going to hold people accountable going forward to make the kind of changes that could prevent it from happening again. We know that there's no such thing as, personal, uh, as perfect security. Um, there are people out there who want to do us harm. Uh, and you know, we don't live in a perfect world. But what we owe the American people is doing every single thing that we can and leaving no stone unturned and providing for their security. And that's what this president's done from the day he took office. And I'll just add, too, at the end, that the Homeland Security is a part of it, but so is the effort that we're launching in Afghanistan to make sure that we finish the job successfully there. So are the kind of partnerships we're building around the world that's allowed us to see more al-Qaeda leaders captured and killed in last year than the year before. And so is the president's outreach to, around the world to build new alliances and new partnerships so that we have more friends, more allies around the world, and there's less space for extremists to operate. So this is a top priority of the president's, and it's one we'll be focusing on next year. Okay, we're going to take two more questions. Uh, the next one comes uh, from, I can't even pronounce that, but uh, let's just say it came from Twitter. Uh, it was actually up to. So the first one says, uh, uh, the spending freeze has been criticized by economists, but doesn't it, it exclude emergency spending like TARP? The second one is uh, from Christopher Bush on Facebook. Of all of what is happening currently, what is being done to reduce the federal budget deficit? Can you speak a little bit to those fiscal issues? Sure, sure. Um, let me uh, take the second one first and talk more broadly about the, uh, the, the deficit, uh, and then I'll get to the, the spending freeze specifically. Um, I think it's important to have a little bit of context, and the president tried to lay this out today. Um, when the president took office, the U.S. federal deficit was $1.3 trillion. It's a big number. Sometimes it's hard to get your head around, but $1.3 trillion. It was the largest deficit in our nation's history. The reason the deficit had gotten so large was because for almost a decade, Washington had taken a lot of steps, two tax cuts, a prescription drug benefit, and two wars without paying for any of them. And so when, when, uh, when, he, took, when he walked into office, the president faced a massive deficit and a ma massive economic crisis. Now what the president said tonight was, under a normal circumstance, he would have loved to have had his initial focus be on bringing down that deficit. But economists on both the right and the left agreed that that would have just plunged us into a, a Great Depression. So he took action. Uh, we increased the deficit. And uh, that has helped. That has uh, pulled us back from the brink. And the economy is now growing again. But in order to get at that real uh, stubborn and large underlying deficit, we're going to have to take a number of uh, we're going to have to take a number of very difficult steps. First and foremost uh, is health reform. The single largest driver of our long-term deficits in this country is the unsustainably high rate of growth of health care costs. It's one of the main reasons why the president decided to focus on this issue. It's not just a human issue, although everything about health care that, uh, that motivates this president to act on it in human terms uh, is real. It's an economic issue. The rate of growth of health care costs is killing our companies, and we need to do something about it, which is why I think you heard the president be so adamant about health care. But it's going to take some other uh, steps as well. And one of the key ones uh, is this uh, spending freeze. And there has been a bit of confusion about the spending freeze. So I think the best way to think about it is uh, in terms of a family budget. 
it does not mean that we are going to freeze every program in the government. Just like if you decided that you needed to, do you needed to cut back as a family, it doesn't mean that you would cut across the board and you would cut your kids' uh, childcare spending just as much as you would cut your vacation budget. You might actually pay more for childcare because it's, it's such a priority for your kids, but you decide you wouldn't take the extra vacation. Or maybe you'd, you'd, you'd cut back and only have one car rather than two cars. That's exactly what's going to go on with the spending freeze here. It's going to provide real discipline and force tough choices, but in some places, like where Heather talked about, like education, we're going to continue to make historic investments. Other places uh, where spending's not working, where spending was in the federal budget because of a special, special interest loophole or because you know, somebody did a political favor for somebody else, we're going to pull those back. And so by placing that disciplining me mechanism on the budget process, we are going to bring down the deficit. But we're going to have to take difficult uh, ste uh, additional steps as well because of the magnitude of the deficit. The president tonight called for a bipartisan fiscal commission, members of both, uh, both parties to come together to step out of the normal political process and get together and really put their money where their mouth is. We've heard a lot of politicians talk about uh, getting tough on fiscal discipline. This is going to be a forum to really put ideas on the table. And so I, I think you're going to see some progress there as well. Okay. Uh, so this is our last question, and uh, I'll ask it of all of you. Uh, we'll start with Heather. Um, it comes from Stephen Walker on Facebook, who simply says, I am 17. How does all of this affect me? That's a great question, Stephen. And first of all, I'm glad that you're uh, watching the State of the Union and participating in the chat and asking these questions because it's really important for young people to be engaged in the political process, to be aware of current events, to be participating, because you can influence this country, you can influence this policy, you can influence your government, uh, and it's really important. Uh, we have tried as an administration to create as many opportunities for people of all ages, but most importantly, young people, to really be part of this government, to want to hear from you, we want to talk to you, we want to talk with you. Um, so we're delighted that you're asking this question. I think that it matters on many, many different levels. All of the issues that we've talked about tonight will, could affect your life, some in more tangible ways than others. Um, the issue of health care is fundamentally important. A lot of people, you're young enough um, probably just to be finishing high school, but a lot of people when they come out of college or uh, when, they're in, when they're in college, struggle to afford health care. And they think, well, I'm young and I'm healthy and I don't need it, but it's actually a very, it's a very risky thing to do. So ensuring that health care is affordable and accessible is incredibly important. The wars that Ben has been talking about, winding down in Iraq, finishing the job in Afghanistan, those are incredibly important to our national security. They're important if you're interested in joining the military. Um, the issues that Brian has been talking about related to jobs um, is incredibly important. When you do complete college and, and look around for what you want to do uh, in government and business, you want to know that there are opportunities there. You want to maybe start your own small business. Um, these are critically important issues. And, and there are a lot of other issues, um, I bet, every day in your community where you can serve, where you can make a difference. Um, it could be in the public uh, education arena at your school. Um, it could be at a nursing home. So I think it's important for the whole panoply of issues. They affect your life, your life in different ways, um, and, and, and it's, it's important to be engaged. And, and so I'm pleased that you are with us tonight. Great. You guys have anything to add? Um, yeah. I mean, Stephen, I just I'd add uh, some several things to what Heather said, um, just in their issues that I work on. Um, obviously, uh, we learned in a very real way that our security is tied to events around the world, um, most painfully in 9/11. Um, but beyond that, uh, I think that the president talks often about the fact that we live in a kind of an interconnected age um, when our fates are really tied to the fates of people beyond our borders as well, um, given the changes wrought by globalization. And that your life and your children's life will be directly tied to our ability to solve problems on a global basis, not just a national one. Just to take a couple of examples, uh, climate change. Climate change is a problem that affects every single nation, and no nation can solve it alone. We could get it absolutely perfectly right um, in terms of you know, trans transitioning to a clean energy co economy. But if other nations don't take similar steps, we're still going to be wrestling with the, the danger of climate change. Uh, epidemic disease, uh, we, can have, uh, we could get healthcare perfectly right in this country. Um, but if the global community can't deal with stopping a, an epidemic disease in a, in a world that we live in where things move across borders, at unprecedented rates, we're not going to be able to wall ourselves off from that. So these global challenges are ones that affect each and every one of us. 
Um, there are also opportunities, though, um, because if we forge effective partnerships with countries around the world, climate change could be not only turned around, but a new clean energy economy, as Brian talked about earlier, could create jobs and opportunity here at home. Um, if we get epidemic disease right, as the President talked about tonight, if we have the kind of public health initiatives that can stop something like H1N1 quickly and effectively in different nations, that will strengthen public health across uh, the entire world. So it's a time of both challenge and opportunity as it relates to the global uh, environment that we're in. I mean, we, um, we saw that when we were in Asia with the President. Uh, here's whole countries, cities that have grown at remarkable pace over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And that's changing the landscape of the world. And you'll grow up to compete with people in other countries, but also to have the opportunity to, as Brian talked about before, maybe export goods to those countries uh, and, and, and enrich your uh, enrich communities with new prosperity. So this interconnection, I think, is something that will define life for, for younger people. Um, and it's why a lot of people, I think, were drawn to the president, is that he represented the kind of 21st century view, um, and why we had a lot of young people in our campaign um, who provided a lot of energy and enthusiasm, but also ideas, um, because they understand things. I mean, just to take the, what we're doing today, um, I think we've all been struck, for instance, by how people around the world who are young have used trend technology in ways that um, have surprised even governments. Uh, many of us uh, followed, for instance, the protests in Iran um, because we saw young people standing up for their rights and doing so not just by braving brutality in the streets, but by using Twitter uh, and by using the internet. And that connects someone like you to a, somebody in Iran who's standing up for their own rights in very difficult circumstances. So we have a lot to learn from young people um, around the world, I think. And that's something that I think uh, is, it will be an opportunity of yours going forward and something that I think gives us a sense of purpose here uh, every day at work. Anything to add? The, the only thing I would add is to pick on what Ben said. You know, I think the, the fact of this president and the fact that he was standing in the, uh, the, the well of the House of Representatives giving a State of the Union address tonight, um, it, it, is, it is a symbol of uh, the change that young people uh, can bring. And uh, we have seen time and time again throughout history, uh, it is young people where the energy uh, and the enthusiasm and the ability and willingness to stand up and say, I'm not going to accept the status quo. I'm not going to just, uh, um, I'm not going to just accept that things have to be the, the way that they are. And whether it's on climate change or whether it's on health care or whether it's on the basic security of middle class families, uh, uh, it's, it, it comes from uh, the young of this country. And, you know, I think we heard from the president tonight, and certainly, certainly I did, that uh, change is hard and it's really complicated and it's messy in a country of 300 million people. Uh, but, and it's easy to get cynical, uh, particularly when all of this technology creates a sort of uh, a, a, dizzying, uh, a dizzying feel, and I know we all feel that in our lives too, but I think that there are also occasions like State of the Unions and nights like tonight that remind you that big change really is possible. Uh, I know that's what motivates all of us uh, to work uh, for this president, and, and uh, I hope it, what, it is what will motivate you into, uh, into public service or any other uh, avenue that you decide to do. But um, I think that uh, tonight is a, tonight's a real symbol of what's possible. Great. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, and thank all of you for uh, joining us as well. Um, I, uh, just a few things. Mona Sutphin, the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy, just uh, uh, published a blog post summing up a lot of the things the President laid out uh, in the speech tonight. So if you want to uh, go through and, and, and check out some of the highlights, that's available at whitehouse.gov. And of course, we're not done answering your questions. Next week, the President will answer questions live. And you can submit them. You can submit videos or written questions. You can vote on others at youtube.com. And we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, and thanks again for joining us, and have a good night.